Have you heard that strength training is good for runners, but you don't know where to start? Do you want to get stronger hips and you're just too confused with the hundreds of exercises everyone recommends? Maybe you learned some hip exercises when you went to physical therapy once and you just felt like they weren't doing anything for you. So you started doing some gym-based exercises, but your knees started hurting. If this is you, I feel you. And I've been there before. This is how I felt when I started uh, running 12 years ago now, uh, the same month as the time of this recording. I was just coming up off of hip surgery for a torn labrum and a torn piece of cartilage, and my hip muscles were extremely weak. And I was just starting to run, and I was looking for exercises to get my hips stronger. Today, I want to teach you five simple exercises to strengthen your all-important hip muscles that you can implement today. No matter what level runner you are, these have been the true, tried, and tested favorites that I've done personally, experimented with, and are the very same exercises that I have programmed for the clients, either getting out of hip pain, knee pain, even ankle pain, believe it or not, or who really want a foundation for which huge, massive improvements in becoming a stronger and faster runner really begin. My name is Dr. Dwayne Scotty. I'm a running physical therapist, coach, educator, and my mission is to preserve the health and longevity of runners everywhere by allowing them to get stronger, run faster, and enjoy lifelong injury-free running. In today's training, I am going to cover my top five hip exercises for runners. And I'm really going to talk about what are the benefits of doing these exercises, why did I choose these exercises, what muscles are we working, common mistakes most runners make when performing these exercises, when is the best time to do these exercises, how many repetitions, how many sets should you do, and how can you make these exercises either easier because they're a little too hard or how do we make them harder because they're a little too easy? So nine out of 10 of you runners listening to this right now are going to unfortunately get injured. And one of the most common reasons for runners getting injured during their hard race training cycles or during just starting out as a runner is not building up the strength and resilience in your running tissues so you can tolerate the demands of either half marathon training or marathon training and trying to get stronger as a runner when you don't have direction can be extremely frustrating you may have been given exercises by a random pt maybe you saw a couple of times but they really didn't know much about running, or you may have seen an exercise on social media posted by a friend who is a runner or one of those running quote unquote influencers, um, but they really don't know much about the body or health for that matter. And if you don't really do specific exercises for your running specific muscles, you wind up doing random exercises without any purpose, rhyme or reason, you do exercises incorrectly, and they may actually be causing more harm than good. And you don't progress your exercises to the next level so you can actually get stronger as a runner. Or you keep getting knee pain, hip pain, or ankle pain during you know all of your race buildups, whether you're training for a half or you're training for a marathon. And you guess instead of following specific targeted exercises. And that leads to frustration, feeling constantly overwhelmed with the amount of information out there. And I don't want that for you. We at Spark Healthy Runner don't want that for you. And we have a plan on how to build a strong foundation as a runner so you can optimize your running for longevity. And it's not a plan most adult runners are following. And as a running physical therapist and coach, I've given thousands of runners a plan for getting stronger hips, 
um, and our plan is going to work for you. This is exactly what we give our clients who work in our high touch point one-on-one coaching program. And really, I'm going to provide these for you. So all you need to do is really do three things. Listen um, and stay tuned to learn about the exercises that are going to help you. Next, you can download my simple mini band exercises, which is an instructional video bonus download where I actually talk you through all of these exercises that you're going to learn about today. So we can actually do them together. And I provide you all of the cues and the corrections that I would be providing for my clients. And the link to download those exercises are actually in the show notes. And then you need to actually perform these consistently, not only once, and then you like forget about them, but you need to do them on a weekly basis so you can start feeling stronger and more confident in growing as a runner. Now, I know how hard it is to grow as a runner. Heck, it took me 12 years to come up with this new brand, uh, this brand new framework really, that I've come up with in trying to grow as a runner. And it could be overwhelming if you don't have a plan. So your running gets slower or maybe worse, it leads to an injury. You either get plantar fasciitis, you get runner's knee, IT band syndrome, hamstring tendinopathy. Um, But when you master the six key parts of your running journey, you'll not only feel more confident in getting stronger as a runner, but you'll stay healthy and enjoy the process of running again. So you can get our latest Spark Healthy Runner ebook, free resource, how to grow as a runner, six step roadmap with a ton of supplemental videos, visuals, video content, um, resources that are really going to help provide you context in really what you're going to start to learn about today. This is like one insy bitsy little piece. The how to grow as a runner framework is the big picture. This is one of those elements in strength training in order to run. So that's really what we're going to be focusing on today. And these again have been the strategies that really have helped all of the one-on-one clients um, hit some huge PRs in their running, actually run without feeling injured or broken and actually get the clarity they need. So I'm excited to actually share these exercises um, in this training on the podcast with you. So make sure you go ahead and download your free ebook on how to grow as a runner by going to learn.sparkhealthyrunner.com to get that resource because it is going to be extremely helpful for progressing in your running journey. And before we actually start Um, with these exercises that I'm super excited to share with you. I wanted to answer your running related question on the podcast. Yes. What questions do you have for me? Get your question answered on the next Ask Dwayne episode on the Healthy Runner podcast. All you need to do is simply click the link in the show notes and contribute your running, your injury, your training, your nutrition, or any honestly fun related question that you have for me or any of the coaches on our Healthy Runner coaching team. And we will be sure to add it to the next Ask Dwayne episode on the podcast. These are always some of my favorite episodes because I know I'm actually asking direct questions that you want to know. And the people who are listening to this want to know. So I would love to answer your question. So please drop it um, in our link where we're collecting all these questions and we'll compile them, organize them in a fashion that will make sense for the listener. And I'd love to answer your question. Uh, So thank you in advance for continuing to add value uh, to our podcast community. And I am actually super excited that we are narrowing down on Apple Podcast. almost 200 reviews and ratings on Apple Podcasts for such a niche-specific running podcast. There are a lot of running podcasts out there, guys, but we are kind of niche-specific and really focusing on your health and providing specific actionable tips on like how to overcome plantar fasciitis, how to actually do a tempo run, right? How to actually fuel your body 
and get the proper nutrition as a runner. And like today's episode, I'm going to share like extreme value with you, like the top five exercises. Literally, I've been implementing for 20 years as a running physical therapist and strength and conditioning specialist, run coach, right? Like these are the exercises. So if you have not yet rated the podcast and you've been getting some serious value here, um, I take time out of my day to really provide this information for you because I'm just so passionate about educating others and I love educating our running community. So my only ask of you is if you don't mind rating the podcast, let's have you help me get to 200 reviews. I think that'd be super cool. And it would just honestly help really the different platforms get this information out to more runners so we can stay healthy and enjoy doing what we love to do. And that's run. So how do we strengthen our hips for running? I'm going to share with you five simple, really can't miss hip exercises any runner can do. Um, the first thing that I really want to cover are what are the benefits of doing these exercises? Or like, why did I choose these exercises as my top five? And there's a couple of reasons. There's actually five reasons because I really thought about this. These are the foundational exercises to activate your hip run specific muscles. Next, we need to actually focus on turning on and learning how to activate these muscles prior to going out for a run, prior to building strength. So actually, next episode on the podcast, it's already a podcast I recorded with Jason Fitzgerald from Strength Running, um, who has some awesome content out there. So you guys, if you're listening to this, you probably listened to his show. Um, we had an amazing uh, chat about strength training and power training as strength training for running. And you can get that on episode 171 on the Healthy Runner podcast if you're listening to this after it has launched. Um, but before you can actually do all the things that Jason and I talked about in the episode of power training, you really need to learn how to activate your running specific muscles first so you don't get knee pain when you implement those exercises. So you don't wind up not actually, you know, using these run specific muscles, which could lead to in the long run, some muscle imbalances that happen. So months down the road, years down the road, you build up your mileage, you do harder training during your running, and then boom, you wind up getting injured. Boom, you wind up getting upper hamstring tendon pain because your hamstrings were dominant and your glutes weren't kicking in properly like they need to be when you're running up hills, right? And you're doing some like hard, you know, terrain, you're maybe doing hill repeats, or you just have a lot of hills around your house and you're training for a marathon, so you can't avoid hills, right? That's what a lot of my clients are going through. So that's really, really important is we need to learn how to activate these muscles before we can actually strengthen them. Next, these muscles are really important to turn on when you are standing on one leg. When we're running, we are always on one leg and your traditional kind of um, hit style workouts, your boot camp classes, your CrossFit classes, your body weight training classes, a lot of the times those classes don't focus on single leg exercises. So for you as a runner, you really need to focus on training on one leg. And these exercises are going to accomplish that. First, kind of activating the muscles that we use when we stand on one leg when we're running. And then you're going to see the last exercise actually gets us standing in that standing position. Um, so lastly, these really will target the run specific muscles and help prevent runner's knee, IT band syndrome, shin splints, ankle tendonitis. And, you know, those of you who have low back pain, usually even those that have instability or SI joint pain. Um, we actually did a full episode on five types of low back pain in runners in episode 155. So if you are a runner with low back pain, definitely check out that episode. Um, because when we get any of these pains that I just mentioned, what our body does is we sense pain and our brain 
sends signals to that area of the body and it tries to protect itself. And usually what it does is it inhibits muscle contraction, specifically of the stabilizer muscles. So if any of you have ever, um, that are listening to this, have ever tore your ACL, maybe in your younger years, or you have a child, uh, to have a teenager, um, who has torn their ACL. One of the, the, the first things that happens, which is like always so wild is the next day after surgery, like your quads are like functioning great day before surgery, next day after surgery, you can't do a quad set. You literally cannot contract your quads. Why is that? Because right now the body, the knee is getting all the swelling in it. And your brain is saying like, what is going on? There's extreme pain down there. I just had some trauma. I had surgery to that area and it inhibits the muscles from contracting. I felt this after my hip arthroscopy. That was really how I actually started running was after that surgery, right? When I was out of shape, getting a little dad bod and I wanted to get back in shape. And I was like, Hey, what should I do? Surgeon was like, go and run outside. Cause you can't run on a treadmill anymore in the gym. So I went outside and started running and that's really where my running journey started 12 years ago. But I was like amazed because the day before my surgery, I was in the gym doing some of these exercises that we're going to talk about. And I was like feeling strong. I'm like, the stronger I am going into surgery, the stronger I am going out of surgery. Um, it's something that, you know, we see a lot with patients that I've helped. And I was amazed the next day after surgery, I literally could not actually contract my glute muscle. Like it, it was literally like mushy tushy. It was, it was the wildest thing to me. Cause I'm like, this doesn't make sense. Like, it's not like the muscle went away in one day. Right. But it's because the brain is sending basically this inhibitory signals and doesn't allow us to contract the muscle because now it's in protective mode. And if you don't actually work with a good therapist to learn how to turn those muscles on after surgery, after an injury, after you have pain, then that leads to long-term muscle imbalances. And that is what we see commonly in a lot of runners who are struggling with runner's knee, hip pain, ankle tendonitis, right? So those are, are by you doing these exercises that we're going to talk about, you're going to actually help prevent those all too common running related injuries. Um, so Five simple exercises, guys, that you can do in the comfort of your home to get stronger, run faster, and stay healthy as a runner. The first exercise is going to be the all-common clamshell. Ooh, clamshell. So, and this is like, I feel like this exercise gets so many misconceptions out there. And I'm going to share with you why we're doing the clamshell. The reason is if you've ever had knee pain, this is one of the most important muscle groups that you actually need to activate, especially for the runners that I see when I evaluate their gait pattern that are what we call collapsers and your knees are dipping in. Or if you've ever like done some squats and you're looking in the mirror and you notice your kneecaps dive in, or you try to jump off a box and you land and your knees dive in. It is basically this internal rotation of your long bone, your femur bone, and the muscles that slow that motion down or control that motion when we run are these deep hip external rotator muscles. The most common one that most people know about is the piriformis muscle. Um, so it's really focusing on the external rotators and you know why I really recommend runners doing this is to really prevent runner's knee, prevent IT band syndrome, or prevent gluteus medius tendon pain, or you might've been diagnosed with air quotes here, trochanteric bursitis. Um, so you have pain on the outside of your hip when you run. And then also one that we don't think about a lot is, and I found this as like a little secret weapon for those with posterior tibial tendonitis or tendinopathy, because most medical practitioners um, are really going to focus on really the ankle only. And this muscle is actually what we call the antipronation muscle up at the hip. So you can actually control a lot of the abnormal motions that we see with running by strengthening this muscle, not only strengthening the ankle and the foot muscles. 
So super, super important. The other muscle that we work with the clamshell is your side hip muscle. So the gluteus medius or the gluteus minimus muscle on the side. And some common mistakes that I see when people do the clamshell is the most common thing is you go to like open up your knee and you roll your whole body back. Meaning your pelvis is not what I like to call like staying home. You want to think about keeping your pelvis forward and not rolling it back. One way you can do this is to bias your trunk, kind of roll toward that side. So let's say I was working my right side. I'm going to roll my upper body forward even a little bit more. And then the other thing that I see is going too fast. It's like, you're just like using momentum, like doing too many reps too fast, not feeling the squeeze. So I really recommend as you do this, you're thinking of lifting your knee, opening your hip up, hold at the top, hold for a second at the top, really tighten that muscle deep in your hip. If you're not feeling anything deep in your butt area, poke, use some what we call tactile input. So like poke in that area and be like, Hey, where's that muscle? Like, Hey guy, turn on, like, let's, let's, let's start working here. And then the other, you know, common mistake that I see is either not progressing resistance and they just do clamshells, like 30 of them, 50 of them. I don't know, like a million of them. And you just stay there like week after week after week. And you're not actually progressing resistance or you progress resistance too fast. So you like do a couple and you're like, this is easy. Let me throw a band around. And the band resistance is actually too much. Now it compromises form and it really turns into just an abductor exercise. So for the side hip muscle, and you're not actually using the deep hip rotator muscles and you're not like opening that hip. So you really should think about rotating, opening the hip and feeling it deep in your butt area. All right. So that was exercise number one, the clamshell. Remember guys, I know this is hard because I'm like, you know, trying to verbally describe the exercises. I have this all laid out for you in the download of how to actually do the exercise. We got like arrows. You got me talking you through the exercise. I'm demonstrating some of these common pitfalls and mistakes that most people make. So it is a instructional video that will be super helpful for you in mastering this exercise. Um, second exercise, bridging with marching. So with this exercise, again, most of you are probably familiar with the bridge. Um, why would I um, prescribe this exercise? Or why do I think this exercise is like a key foundational tool for all runners? Um, if you have a history of upper hamstring tendon pain, proximal hamstring tendinopathy, this is going to be for you. If you have a history of low back pain, especially instability or SI joint pain, um, again, see the low back pain episode I mentioned earlier, 155 on the podcast. Um, or if you have hamstring dominance, or maybe you've been told like, hey, your like glutes aren't really kicking in or your glutes are a little sleepy. Um, and you know that is something that I do think does exist. However, it's not like they're not like contracting at all, but I do think there are muscle imbalances and I do think that you can fix them quickly. It's not something you need to like carry on that narrative for the rest of your life. Like you have weak glutes or your glutes never activate. So there are ways, and that's why we're doing this exercise actually, is to actually help that muscle turn on, teach your body to actually use your glutes as a hip extensor instead of just using your hamstrings. So what muscles are we working? The glute max, right? The big beefy muscle back there. That's our hip, primary hip extensor. And then we're also working the lower abdominals if we do this correctly, as I demonstrate in the video. And then a little sneaky one here that you probably haven't thought of is because we're actually going to be marching as we do this and really focusing on keeping your pelvis level. It's like a tabletop. If you had a glass of water on your pelvis, you don't want that glass of water to spill. So your pelvis stays super level. And what we're actually doing is working the deep rotators in your lower lumbar spine. So we call this the multifidi muscles. So we're essentially doing like an isometric resisting rotation because you're not allowing your spine to rotate. Some of the common mistakes with this one is really just feeling it in your quads or your hamstrings. If you're feeling in your quads, 
then you're definitely pushing like with your feet outward. That's why I like to lift my toes up, dig my heels into the ground. When I do this exercise, I feel like that helps shift the focus to the glutes. Again, you can poke there, kind of poke your butt a little bit, be like, hey, are you like nice and firm on the left? Is it equal to the right? Sometimes you feel one side is a little mushier than the other side. One side might be like firm and tight and the other side isn't so tight. So that means there is a little bit of muscle balance there. You need to turn on one side. And again, why does that happen? It could have been an old injury. It could have just been, you know, something that you were doing with your movement, your technique, and your body just didn't kind of learn how to use that muscle. For some reason, you compensated on that side. So I wouldn't like stress about it. I wouldn't worry about it. It's not something for you to get anxiety over, to think something's wrong with your body, but it's just something that can be fixed, can be correctable, okay, with doing this exercise. So that is the bridging with marching. Number three, the dead bug. So with these exercises, I I don't know if I clarified, but all of these are going to be done with a miniband resistance wise, unless we'll talk about like, how do we regress the exercise, make it a little easier for you. But you're going to do these with a little mini band exercise. You can get them anywhere, um, Amazon, any, any store that sells any exercise equipment has mini bands. Um, we give our clients spark healthy runner mini bands. Um, uh, but the reason why I love the dead bug, um, is because number one, it's a reciprocal motion, just like running is meaning you use one arm in one direction and the opposite knee. Like when we run, it's reciprocal. So you use the opposite arm as leg when you're doing that. I also love giving this if you have a weak core. So if you are postpartum, um, as long as you don't have any rectus diastasis, so you have the separation of your rectus muscle and you have like a big divot there, make sure you're doing the exercises that your therapist is giving you to close that first. Um, Or if those of you who have continual front of the hip pain, or you always feel like your hip flexors are tight and you're stretching your hip flexors and you're rolling your hip flexors and they always still feel tight. So this is going to be for you because a lot of times I find that it's actually weakness of the hip flexors and they're not doing their job functionally as a stabilizer. And I already mentioned that I love the reciprocal motion of this and it's also a stabilizer for your core. So what muscles are we working? The core muscles, your lower abdominals, your glute max, and then we're working the hip flexors isometrically to stabilize your body. Some of the common mistakes I see with this is arching the back off the ground. So you're arching your back and you're using a lot of momentum. You're allowing that pelvis to kind of roll forward. The whole purpose here, guys, is to use those lower abdominal muscles. How do we do that? We keep that back nice and flat on the ground. So now coming up next, I'm going to share with you the final two exercises to help you get stronger hips for running. And, you know, before I do that, if this training has been eye-opening to you, um, if you heard something that you might have learned that you were like, hey, I've had knee pain for a while. I didn't know my hip muscles could actually help that. Um, and, you know, you're this has been helpful for you at all. And you know, just a little surprised that like, Hey, I can actually do these in the comfort of my own home and they're not too hard. And I can get a little more bang for my buck in not only staying healthy as a runner, but actually improving and getting stronger as a runner. Pretty cool. Then really, I would love to get this word out to more runners just like you. And one way to do that is if you're listening to the video version of this, hit the like button. Um, because really that will allow others to actually see this and it'll allow me to continually creating content of high value just like this. So you can stay healthy as a runner and enjoy lifelong injury-free running. So it means the world to me when you guys do that. Um, So if you can hit that like button, please, and thank you. And if you're listening to the podcast, if this is helpful, like copy that link and send it to a runner who needs to hear this, who's always getting injured or who is just not getting faster, not getting stronger, and wants to really get some key exercises that they can easily implement into their running routine. So the fourth exercise, the side wall slide, or what I like to call the humbler. Why do I do this? Why would I recommend you do this? 
It's the single most important running muscle that we have and by far is the most common running muscle that is weak, that is inhibited, that is causing excessive hip drop with running and a collapsing gait pattern. Um, when I analyze all the runners that I see with their, with their running form. So focusing on this muscle will help protect you as a runner, improve your running form, improve your running economy and prevent runner's knee, IT band syndrome outside of the hip pain. What are the muscles that we're working? Your side hip muscles. So the gluteus medius or the minimus muscle, the muscle underneath that, those help stabilize our pelvis when we're standing on one leg, when we land. So when our foot hits the ground, keeps our pelvis nice and level. What's the common mistake I see with this? Most people don't do this against the wall. So what happens is when they kick up to the side, so those of you listening to the audio version, think like Jane Fonda exercise, like, I don't know, 1990, um, you're lying on your side and you're just kicking your leg up, right? You've all seen that exercise. And most people, what they do is their foot comes in front of the hip joint. So what you're using is more of your TFL muscle, which is the muscle that connects to your IT band. You've probably heard of the IT band before. And that really leads to this muscle imbalance that the TFL is the primary muscle working as opposed to the side hip stabilizer that we really want you to use when your foot hits the ground to keep your pelvis nice and level. So that's one mistake. The other mistake I see is rolling the pelvis back as you kick, which inadvertently puts your hip back in that same position, in a flexed position. So we want you to keep your foot slightly behind the hip joint. So that's why we use a wall. I have exact instructions on how to do this exercise correctly. Um, and then the other one that I commonly see runners do is they use like their hip hikers. So like your side oblique muscles, um, you might really just, you know, try to hike the whole pelvis up to get your foot up. And, you know, sometimes that happens if you're really weak in that area. And then what I would do is if you can't do it correctly with proper form, I would just start out with that clamshell exercise, number one, before actually progressing here. Last, final exercise, guys, down to number five, the standing march exercise. Why do I like to do this? This is the introduction to single leg stability for you as a runner and learning how to use the muscles that we just talked about in the first four exercises when you're standing on one leg. So what are the muscles that we're working with this exercise? Your side hip muscles, your external rotators, your glute max to stabilize the leg that you're standing on. We're also using the hip flexors on the non-standing leg. So this is now we're starting to incorporate single leg stability and then also with movement. So what are some of the common mistakes I see with this? The hip dropping or your pelvis is dropping, not holding for a second at the top and not allowing that hip flexor to stabilize, maybe going too fast. Also leaning over to the side. So your trunk will lean over if you have some weakness. So those are the common errors that I see that I want you to avoid when you start doing the standing march exercise. So when is the best time to do these exercises. One of the best times is really before your normal strength workout. And this is when I will do them almost as like a dynamic warm up. So if you are already doing a gym based program, you're doing squats, you're doing deadlifts, you're doing the machines in the gym, right? These are going to be so helpful to actually activate some of those muscles and provide some blood flow to the hip area, protect your knees so you don't get knee pain with squatting. So that's a great time. The other good time to do this is after a run. After you get home from a run, get your mini band and go through these exercises. So you can do them as like a quick circuit after your run. How many of these should we do, right? How many repetitions? How many sets? Really what I recommend for those just starting out and beginning is shoot for 10 to 12 repetitions for one set. And I like to cycle through all the exercises, all five. And then as you get stronger, as it starts getting a little easier, you can build up to two or three sets and doing that full circuit. 
So how can you make these exercises easier or harder? So you can make them easier by doing them without the mini band. So actually just using your leg as resistance and honestly, quite a, frankly, most of you in order to get the technique right, will need to start there. That's where we start with all of our clients in kind of what I like to call the restorative phase when I start working with them. If they do have runner's knee, they do have IT band syndrome, they're in pain right now. I'm not using a band because I need to restore their fundamental running movement patterns. And how we do that is by activating these muscles. And I want to make sure that we get proper activation and we're not adding resistance too early because then they don't do it correctly and they don't activate the right muscles. They do all the substitutions we kind of already mentioned. However, that being said, guys, you should not be doing this without a mini band for more than two to four weeks, maybe six tops. I've seen many runners who are like, yeah, my PT gave me these exercises. I've been doing them for like six years. I've been doing them for like 10 years. I'm like, these same exercises? I'm like, are they hard? They're like, no, but I was just told like I should do them forever or I figured they worked, so I should just keep doing them. We need progression, right? We need to actually make them harder so you can continue to get stronger. That would be like saying, you know, you want to run a faster marathon, but you never, ever do different training. You never try to run faster during your runs. You never implement speed work. You never actually run more mileage during the week. You never, right? Like you wouldn't do that. So why would you actually do the same exercise like forever without progressing them and making them harder? So how do we make them harder? We add resistance to the band. And then I have a whole series on my YouTube channel on like standing progressions. And then we have different phases of the Healthy Runner Strength Program that I have it all laid out for you on how we progress the clamshell to a standing position. And there's kind of a little custom exercise that I created that really activates those deep hip external rotator muscles. And then we progress into a standing clamshell. So there are different progressions that we can do with our feet on the ground, which is so important because when we're running, our feet are on the ground. So now if you want some clarity on how to actually integrate these exercises and the progressions like into your run strength or training plan. That's exactly what we do with our Spark Healthy Runner signature one-on-one coaching program. We teach you how to grow as a runner to not only crush your running goal, but avoid feeling frustrated because you either get injured or you don't get any faster. And we really act as your guide in mastering the six key steps of your running journey. Mindset, strength training, structured run plan, nutrition, recovery, and race strategy. So when you execute the six key parts or steps of your running journey, you'll not only feel more confident in getting stronger and faster, you'll stay healthy and enjoy the process of running again and crush some races along the way when we're working together and long into the future. So just like a well-built home uh, will require little maintenance and bring you a lifetime of memories for you and your family, your running will do the same. Once you master these six key parts of your running journey, learn more about our Spark Healthy Runner Signature Coaching Program and schedule a call with me um, to make sure that it's a good fit for you by going to learn.sparkhealthyrunner.com forward slash coaching. So lastly, remember how earlier I said that if you don't implement these principles in getting stronger hips, uh, you're going to continue to get frustrated, feeling lost, you're going to get injured, or you're not going to get any stronger. So be sure to get your download by clicking the link in the show notes so you can learn exactly how to perform these exercises correctly and implement them. And you need to be consistent right? I can't do the exercise for you, unfortunately, but don't you worry. I'm doing the exercise myself. Um, if this was insightful for you, if this was helpful, would you mind copying the link and sharing it with a running friend who can use it? I want our community to continue enjoying lifelong injury-free running and getting stronger hips, just like Secura says, hips don't lie. Um, 
It's one of the foundational principles in growing as a runner. So thank you in advance for doing that. Thanks for tuning in. As always, let's maintain a strong mind, a strong body, and let's just keep on running. Until next time.